All right. Uh, how about if I try to pull your leg then today, again? Uh, <coughs> well, I want now to verify the second version of work energy theorem. Actually, I will do it for both uh, work energy, uh, both versions of work energy uh, theorem. Well, imagine that. <coughs> Uh, let's say that the weight of this ball is one newton, and uh, I will I'll pick it up and move it by one meter up. And let let's say that I do it in such a way that uh, that its velocity uh, that that I uh, th that the velocity of the ball instantaneously changes from zero to to a co constant velocity with which I move. And that then I move with a constant velocity, velocity. So that way, it's easy for you to evaluate what force I am applying, right? So ex except for the very beginning, when I had to apply practically infinite force uh, along an entire path, I'm applying a constant uh, force equal to the in magnitude to the weight of the ball, if the ball is moved with a constant velocity, right? And also at the end, I stop it instantaneously. Uh, something like this will not pr uh, happen practically because there is a tiny, uh, tiny distance that uh, that the ball ha I had to accelerate the ball, and over there I had to accelerate it again. Um, anyway, so how about if I now calculate changes in energies and work? So I will now calculate what is the change in mechanical energy of the ball when it is when it is moved by one meter up well so let's start uh, which means that it is uh, equal to the change in kinetic energy and kinetic energy well what is kinetic energy now and now so change in kinetic energy is zero joules uh, now plus a uh, change in uh, potential energy this gives me change in mechanical energy um, well uh, I hope that you memorize the expression for gravitational potential energy near the surface so uh, let's say no matter now where you choose the reference the reference point change in potential energy will be the same uh, so let's say that we choose reference frame at the floor. So potential energy of this ball now is now let's say that this is one meter. How much? Uh, I can't hear. Nine point eight. Uh, no, uh, nine point eight is acceleration due to gravity. What you were thinking is probably you are multiplying weight by acceleration due to gravity so he, you, he mult I think that he multiplied one Newton by uh, 9.8 uh, meters per second square well it is already overkill uh, because and con you can uh, you confuse weight with mass you have already product mg I gave you one Newton is mass of the ball multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity so one Newton is, uh, which, which means that this, this ball uh, has a mass of one-tenth of a kilogram. Uh, <coughs> all right, so uh, uh, mg is one Newton. I have to multiply it now by what? By one meter, correct? So mgh gives me potential energy as, at this point. So potential energy over here is one joule now if I move it up by another meter it will increase to how much to two joules right because it will be two meters above the surface uh, so the change is going to be one joule all right so change in uh, uh, potential energy is one joule which means that the change in mechanical energy is one joule now, let's find out how much work was done on the ball. Who was working on the ball? I was working on the ball, and the earth was working on the ball. I, uh, I had to apply a force of 
one newton upward uh, and the displacement was upwards and if I, if I moved it at a constant velocity, actually integration of the work is simple. We can factor out that force in front of the integral and have uh, work equal to just my force multiplied by the total displacement. So uh, now I applied for, uh, let's, uh, what, what kind of multiplication do I have to use, by the way? We, um, how many multiplications do we know? Four. Which of those four I had to use to find that work? Jessica. Scalar product, correct. So I had to multiply uh, the force, which was one newton up. Displacement, which was one meter up. And cosine of the angle between the two vectors. Now they both were up, cosine, uh, so angle between them is zero, cosine is one. So I performed work, uh, okay, so this is work done by me. Oh, why don't I write it down? So I performed work of one joule. Now I have to add work performed by the earth. Well, um, Again, Earth was uh, exerting constant force of one Newton down, right? Uh, we can pull out that one Newton down also in front of the integral and find that work is equal to the scalar product of force and displacement. Uh, so force magnitude, uh, let's multiply it. So we have to multiply one Newton, magnitude of the first vector, times one meter, magnitude of the second vector times cosine of 180 degrees. Cosine of 180 degrees is negative 1, which means that the work performed by the Earth was 1 minus 1 joule, which means that the work done on the ball was 0 joules. And the second version of work energy theorem says that uh, change in mechanical energy is equal to the work done on the, on the ball, from which I conclude that 1 is equal to 0. What did I do wrong? Now, you have to uh, make a brainstorm, talk to each other, find out what I did wrong. It's a very likely error which you will make on the test. You don't have to check arithmetics because we were multiplying only ones or zeros. Uh, and adding ones and zeros. So, so that one is, is cor correct. Co there is a conceptual. Yes, yeah, we have a. Uh, well, over here, I, I, I made the conclusion that this one joule, which is change in mechanical energy, is supposed to be equal to the work, which is zero joules. So, conclusion is a one joule is equal to zero joules. Of course it is impossible. Well, so what, what is, what, uh, does it mean that the work energy theorem is wrong? Uh, what about it? Oh, I have to change it to non-conservative work? Yeah. yeah, Mark says, repeat it again. All uh, right, see that? And I, on purpose, I just, uh, I've hidden adjectives because this is what you do. You do not use adjectives. It is very important to use them. And Mark was right that I've hidden adjective which work I calculated. I have to calculate indeed work done on the ball, but due to 
interaction which I have not included in the potential energy in general. Or if I'm smart, non-conservative. I recognize all other, all interactions which are conservative and put them, put them in. So things which, if I want to compare it, uh, with the mechanical energy, I already calculated uh, work, gravitational work over here and it is there. This is gravitational work. So I should only take non-conservative work and non-conservative work, who performed that work? I did. How about Earth? It did not. Correct. Now work performed by me was one joule, which agrees, right? So indeed, if I look at these two, I recognize that the change in mechanical energy is equal to non-conservative work. Now that work is, oh sorry, this work is supposed to be equal to what? Yes, uh, uh, well not one, but uh, to which energy? A uh, what? Yeah. If I add these two works, which work do I calculate? The network, correct. And the network is supposed to be equal to what? W a change in what energy? Kinetic energy. Great. Let's see that. Yes, so change. So work per network is zero. That one is zero, and it is supposed to be equal to change in kinetic energy. Uh, what was change in kinetic energy? Zero. Yeah, so both versions work if we do not confuse which parts to, uh, uh, I mean, what to take from what and put where. Because if we confuse, and we will, in the future, we'll have more versions of work energy theorem and more versions of Newton's second law, make sure that you do not uh, confuse uh, one with the other. Uh, now, there's uh, w one more uh, uh, example in which I would like uh, uh, also to discuss. Yeah, because now, <coughs> what is the purpose of, of uh, Newton's uh, second law? What does it really do? It links something with something. What? A uh, what? Oh, no, the, uh, well, don't say details. In general, what, what mass and acceleration are and what force are? Let's start with this. What is force? W why did we introduce the concept of force? What's the purpose? What does it describe? Interactions, correct. Force describes interactions. Right, so on one side of the equation, we have a description of interaction. Now, on the other side, we have an attribute of an object and a, a variable which is fixed for a particular object and acceleration. What acceleration describes? What is the purpose of it? It describes motion. If we know acceleration, we know where the object is and how, how it moves at a particular instant. We can figure out how it moves forever. Uh, so. Newton's second law links interaction with motion. See what uh, work energy theorem does. Work describes what? Work is a description of how. Yeah, if I say that the we say. Uh, no, work is not energy. Work is a way of transferring energy from one object to another object. If you want to say something about energy, well, let's start then what energy, what energy describes. For simplicity, think about kinetic energy. What kinetic energy says about an object? Well, it has also fixed attribute for an object and then square of speed. Motion. Kinetic energy also tells us how an object moves. 
it says with what speed it has. Practically, I mean, I, I almost think, I, I mean, I think, when I think about kinetic energy, I, I don't really m distinguish much between kinetic energy and speed of the object. If I know one, I automatically know the other one. So, so uh, kinetic energy does the same thing as speed, describes how fast object moves. Uh, all right, uh, <coughs> yeah, because why would I care for that? Because then I can predict where the object is going to be at any time. I can predict the future, and this is what we are trying to do, to design things that they work. <coughs> you want to have a car and a reliable car. You want to get into the car, and you don't want now that probably you will, turn be, you will be able to turn it on and get home. But maybe it will move in a completely different direction. We want, it, we want it to, we design it to perform a particular task, which we want to do that. All right, now, how about work? And actually the phrase, the first phrase in the, uh, in the definition of work, which I provided to you is, is that it, is, it describes interaction in a co cumulative way. Force describes interaction, inst instantaneous uh, interaction. So, so we know at what, e at each instant, what is the value of that interaction? For work, we have to have a set an interval. But it also describes interaction. So work energy theorem also links interaction with motion. Interaction is described in terms of work. Motion is described of interaction uh, in terms of uh, kinetic energy. Uh, well, it looks like it's redundant. We have two theorems, well, uh, two statements which do, which do the same thing. And really, it is redundancy. Whatever you can find out from work energy theorem, you can find out from uh, Newton's second law and vice versa. Well, why do we have two? For convenience, right. At some situations, it is more convenient to use one. For uh, at some situations, it is more convenient to use the other. And actually, you should be able to, I mean, uh, with a little bit of practice, you will recognize when what is more convenient. So how about if I give you a, a problem like that? I, I'm, I'm trying to, de to design a system based on this ball. Well, really, I want to throw, throw this ball in such a way that it barely touches the ceiling. Uh, too, too strong. Do you understand what I'm trying to achieve? How should I throw the ball? What speed? I mean, I wanted to do it vertically. Yeah? So, so I already know two things about uh, velocity. I know the direction. Uh, so uh, I, I know two, ex uh, I mean, two horizontal components of velocity. They are zero. So the only one which I'm interested in is the vertical component of velocity. Oh, that was good. Uh, how should I toss this ball? Now, you can, <coughs> we can do it both ways. We can use it Newton's second law, and we can use it work energy theorem. Uh, who would use, uh, let's vote at this time, and, and actually I will give two solutions, and we will find out which one is simpler, and then we'll think why is it simpler. Uh, so who would vote that you, let's use, who can see how to solve this problem using Newton's second law? Nobody? It's bad. <laughs> uh, who can see how to use, uh, how, to, uh, how to do it from work energy theorem? J.D., how would you do that? Well, you would uh, choose the convenience reference point of having a zero, um, zero potential energy where you're throwing the ball from relate the amount of kinetic energy to the height you're trying to achieve and the energy that would be reached at the top of that. Uh, so you would, you would uh, uh, which version of work energy theorem would you suggest to use? Um, that, uh, that the also, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which version we use as long as we are consistent. Uh, right, so how about if you use second version of work energy theorem? Now, uh, do you know why I picked second one? 
because if I think about which work is equal to change in which uh, change in which uh, energy. Yeah. Now, the question is for the speed with which speed I should release the ball, right? So, so when the ball is released, what is its speed over here? Uh, so after I release, identify uh, interactions. What interacts with the ball? Earth. All right. What else? Mark says nothing. If you said air, you could accept it. You can, um, I mean, I would accept it. You could recognize that, that, that air interacts with that. However, that interaction is teeny tiny. The ball does not move sufficiently fast. So indeed, Mark is right that there is only one interaction which we have to, to, to take into account. It's that uh, gravitational interaction. So if I use the second, now, is, is that interaction conservative or not? Conservative. All right. So we will have it in the in mechanical energy. How much work we will have in uh, non-conservative work then? Zero. Correct. So mechanical energy is going to be conserved because work energy theorem. If this term is zero, then change in mechanical energy is going to be zero. Which means that mechanical energy uh, throughout that flight is going to be. Uh, uh, to be uh, conserved. All right. Well, so I would need, obviously, to measure how far I w yeah, because I mean this is uh, this is what I want. I I see how far that ceiling is. So, according to uh, J uh, D, uh, J D, I should write equations that mass of the ball multiplied by speed the square of the speed which I want to toss the ball divided by 2 plus 0. Now that 0 was because JD picked the reference in my hand, so I'm consistent. This is, key, this is mecha mechanical energy at the beginning when the ball was released, and that one is supposed to be equal to kinetic energy at the top, which is going to be how much? 0. Plus change in po uh, plus potential energy over there. Well, but if uh, if we pick that uh, potential energy is in my palm was uh, zero, which means that potential energy over there is mass of the ball uh, times acceleration due to gravity times the distance from the hand to the ceiling, uh, which means that. I should toss it with speed m and m cancels. You see that? Uh, so, uh, the speed should be square root of 2gh. I found out how I should toss the ball. I should give uh, the, the vertical component of velocity should be square root of 2 times acceleration due to gravity times the distance from my hand to the uh, to the ceiling. All right, let's now do the same thing using Newton's second law. Well, from Newton's second law, uh, I can recognize, well, <coughs> let's recall free body diagram again. How many forces are exerted on it? Just one, gravitational force. So the net force is equal to gravitational force. Therefore, the ball is going to move with, a, with an acceleration due to gravity. Right. <coughs> well, if it is uh, going to move with acceleration due to gravity, it means that ve uh, velocity is going to be linear function of time and distance is going to be a quadratic function of time. I even don't force you here to integrate those two because in principle you should integrate acceleration to get velocity and then uh, integrate velocity to get uh, position. But I assume that for motion with constant acceleration, you know the three equations by heart. Um, all right. So, <coughs> well, I'm going to toss it with a certain uh, habit of even if I put uh, zero over here to indicate that this is that initial uh, speed. Uh, so velocity at any, a y component of velocity at any instant, 
is going to be this uh, initial uh, vertical component of velocity minus acceleration due to gravity times t. And uh, if I choose now the reference at my hand, I also, well, can write down the position, vertical component of position at any time is vertical component of initial position. And for simplicity, I will choose origin at my hand. So it will be zero plus vertical component of velocity times t minus gt squared over 2. <coughs> uh, all right, now we got, uh, well, at the highest point, at the highest point, speed is supposed to stop, right? I mean, the, 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 bo the ball is supposed to stop, which means that if I put v0 minus g times t, let's call this 1, when it hits the, the ceiling, it, this one should be 0, and the ball, is sh uh, the ball at that time should be at height h. So v0 times t1 minus gt squared over 2, gt1 squared over 2 is supposed to be equal to 1. Well, I, I got now two equations with two unknowns. One unknown is v0, the other unknown is time. I can solve for it. I mean, how about if we do it? Yeah, so, um, yeah, why don't I calculate t from this expression? So from this expression, uh, t1 is equal to v0 divided by g, and plug this t over there, so I will have v0 times v0 divided by g minus uh, g uh, v0 over g squared divided by 2 and this should be equal to h. Now let's see if I have it uh, if I have it right. Uh, yes, okay. Um, so let's com combine these. I mean, let's simplify this expression over here. So here I have v0 squared over g minus, and here I have v0 squared. Now, I have g and g squared over here. So, it, so g will be in the denominator, and I have this, uh, oh, this v0 over g. And here I have v0 over 2g. And this is supposed to be equal to h. Now I can uh, sub subtract these two. If I subtract these two, I, I see that this term is half of this one. Can you see that? So I really can write down that this is v0 squared over 2g. So v0 is equal to square root of 2gh, which should make us happy, right? Because <coughs> We got the same expression. Yeah, we found that no matter how I calculated it, uh, I, uh, I got the same result. Which solution is simpler? Work energy theorem. Now, why work energy theorem was simpler than Newton's second law? Where was the trick? Oh, well, I mean, I avoid uh, really integrals here. Uh, uh, and in principle, uh, I mean, we have no integrals because we made a lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, shortcuts already. Yeah, so, so in principle, this was integral. 
Yeah, MGH is in principle integral. Uh, so, so here we remember formulas which avoided uh, integrate, which allowed us to avoid integration. And over here we had formulas which avoided, uh, uh, which allowed us to avoid uh, integrations. Uh, uh, no, but uh <coughs> well, let me let me now uh, show another problem. Uh, how about if I? Uh, drop the ball and I'm interested in what, what will be the speed of the ball after one second. Um, <coughs> let's now solve this problem also using both, uh, both uh, approaches. Which approach would you prefer to I mean, who, who knows how to use, how to solve it from uh, Newton's second law? How would, yeah, so how would you solve this from Newton's second law? Correct, uh-huh. Right, so we recognize, if we use Newton's second law, we, we, es we evaluate net force, we recognize that the net force is zero, uh, so, sorry, uh, equal to gravitational force. So we recognize that the motion is a motion with constant acceleration. From that, we find out uh, the, uh, the, the speed. Yes, yeah, so now motion is also vertical, so we already know two-thirds of the solution. We know that all, both horizontal components are zero. And the ver for the vertical component, We can recognize that the net force, a vertical component of net force, is equal to uh, gravitational force. From then we find out that acceleration, vertical component of ac acceleration, is just minus g. Uh, so from that I can find that the vertical component of velocity, which happens to be speed, is equal initial velocity, or how about if I just write the vertical component of velocity. Initial velocity, which was vertical component of initial velocity just after I released it was zero minus g times t. Right now, uh, I told you that the flight lasts one second, so, well, it will be minus g times one second. Uh, <coughs> we can think about it. this one second is just the delta t given, given time of flight. This is how we would solve it using uh, uh, Newton's second law. How about if you find it using work energy theorem? The speed at the uh, the speed at the bottom. Yes, so speed actually is going to be equal g times delta t. Well, for the work energy theorem, I can find out how much work what is how much work is done. Let's say you, I use the first version of work energy theorem. It doesn't matter which one. So this time, for just for 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 a kick, I will use the first version of work energy theorem. I can find out easily how much work is done, right? Because force is constant, so I just need to find the displacement uh, in time delta t. Well, what will be the displacement? The displacement will be only in a vertical direction. Right? So, uh, so that displacement is going to be equal to uh, acceleration uh, due to gravity. Um, yeah, because I mean, Let's come back from the, from the expression for position. Right, so now the displacement, the change uh, in the vertical component of position is difference between these two. So it is initial uh, velocity, vertical component of initial velocity when I release is how much? Zero. Now, here I have acceleration due to gravity, and if I choose the reference time at the instant as I released, then t and delta t are going to be the same. So, uh, 
change in the vertical component of position is going to be minus g times delta t squared over 2. This is by how much the ball is moved, right? Now, the force is going to be constant. Gravitational force is going to be constant. And y component is going to be minus mg. Uh, so, if I multiply force and displacement, I will get how much work was done. Don't confuse this w with this w. What this w means? Network. How much? What? Network. This is work. Network. What this w means? Network. No. Weight. Vertical component of weight. Um, we have too few letters, so be careful about that. Uh, so, work. And now I can actually, since I have components, I don't even have to think about the angle. So, I, when, I, when I multiply displacement in the component, first component times first component, so it is 0 times 0, plus second component by second component, so it will be this, uh, mg delta t squared, actually g squared, divided by 2. And z components are 0, so it's 0. This is how much work, gravitational work was done. And it is supposed to be equal to the change in kinetic energy, right? So, now change in kinetic energy happens since I release it from the, from, I mean, when I release it, its kinetic energy is how much? Zero. So change in kinetic energy is speed uh, at the bottom, I mean, after one second, uh, squared multiplied by mass of the object divided by two minus zero joules. Now, these two have to be equal. Actually, how about if I indicate that this is the same uh, time interval? So I have that mass times square of speed divided by two is supposed to be equal mass times square of acceleration due to gravity times square of the time divided by 2. Well, m and 2 and m and 2 here cancel, uh, and I get that speed is equal g times delta t. Are we happy? Why not? You should be happy. Well, should be happy for one reason. What? <coughs> this is the speed which we found using Newton's second law. Uh, no, sorry, using work energy theorem. Uh, this is speed which we found using Newton's second law. They are identical, which means that we are really good. Yeah, we can use whichever we want, and get always the same result. This is true. Yes? Uh, because, uh, good question. Why, how did I change this minus sign to plus sign over here? Well, we have to be careful. Again, uh, record, I mean, use the adjectives. Precisely describe the symbols. Uh, can you help me to read that? R can you read that? Explain to me. What's this? Uh, this oh, uh, yeah. We live in America. We have to use English language. So it's not V sub Y. Say it in English. What's V sub Y is? It's not velocity. It's what? Vertical component of velocity. Correct. Let's read that. Well, read it. No! That one was vertical component of velocity. Yeah, and here, see that? I mean, how easy it is, because the differences in notations are very subtle, and you have to be careful to recognize the meaning. This one is no speed. Right. Now, <laughs> how speed and velocity are related. Speed is magnitude of velocity. Okay, so going very formally, because I mean, 
since since I had only one non-zero component of velocity, I had just to take absolute value of that and get speed. Formally, how speed is related to velocity? The for, by the formula. Square root of velocity, square. Right. Uh, what's square? Not vector square. Scalar square. Cor correct. We have to use scalar product. All right. So it means that the square root of x component square plus y component square plus z component square. Uh, let's square x component of velocity over here. Zero. That one, whatever we got here. Right? So we have to square that. And the third one, zero. Now, when we square this number, we will get a positive number or negative number? Positive number. Take square root. What will happen with the minus? It disappears. Do you, do you see that? Right? So, so really be careful about uh, notation. But this was just a digression. I'm glad that you brought it up. However, important thing that the results made us happy because we got both results the same. <coughs> However, I understand why. Why were you not happy? What's your name? Me? Yeah? Uh, What's your name? Isaac. Isaac. Why Isaac? And I understand you. Isaac was unhappy with the second solution. Why? Because I looked at the wrong spot. Oh, you, oh no. <laughs> uh, another, another reason for being unhappy with this solution. It's much more difficult, correct. I mean, it's complicated. Chris, yes, you want to? That's what I was saying. This is what you were supposed to, yeah. All right, yeah, so now uh, look at the two solutions together. In the first problem, it was, uh, it was more convenient to use work energy theorem, right? And you should recognize that in these situations, like the first one, you should use work energy theorem to look for the solution. In the, now, in the uh, situation like, like the second one, it's better to use Newton's second law. What's the difference between the two situations? And let's try to generalize when it is easier to use work energy theorem and when it is easier to use Newton's second law. Ah, very good, J.D. I, I mean, this is, the, this is right on the target. That answer is right on the target. If you know how interactions change with time, then it is easier to use Newton's second law. When you know how interactions vary with position of the object, then it is easier to use the work energy theorem. Uh, now, uh, there, are, there, are, there are situations there because now, like in a, uh, in a tossing, tossing object near the surface, actually both solutions are relatively simple because we know both. Uh, we, we know how interaction depends on time and how interaction depends on position. But for example, if I think about a problem with a spring, it is much easier to figure out what, uh, how force depends on position than how it depends on time. Therefore, it is much easier to use work energy uh, theorem over there. Uh, okay, now I intended actually to, to introduce, I mean, this is the uh, end of, uh, of digressions and I want now to, to talk about uh, one more subject from chapter 8 which won't be on the test though um, but uh, potential energy says says about uh, uh, work performed yeah, because why did we induce concept of potential energy so that we don't have integrate work every time Right, this, this was the purpose. So, so really, uh, potential energy gives us information about interactions also. Well, force also says about interactions, which means that these two quantities have to be related. Work and, uh, sorry, force and potential energy must be related because work and potential energy are related. 
Uh, so if we know potential energy, we should be able to find out force. Actually, we know already the other way, right? If we know force, how do we, how, how do we determine potential energy? Think about how did we get the expression for, potential, for gravitational potential energy near the surface, that it is MGH, where that formula came from. How did we do that? We calculated gravitational work from the reference point to the considered point. So, so if I know how force varies, in, uh, how force depends on position, I can find out what is potential energy everywhere by calculating work from the reference point to the considered point uh, for that conservative interaction. Well, now I want to, to talk about inverse relationship. If I, if I forgot expression for the force, but I remember expression for the potential energy, I can find out the force. Because what we have to do is that force is opposite, well, to the expression which is referred to as gradient and I bet that most of you already heard that word although you, did, you haven't noticed it. I don't know why, is, why, is, why this is the phenomenon but I bet that you will hear it again in the next two weeks. Not for, and not from me. You will hear it on TV. Uh, uh, say word gradient. Ciao. Gradient. gradient. Okay. So, uh, conservative force is opposite to the gradient of potential of, uh, energy associated with this interaction. Now, uh, scalar comp uh, when we calculate a gradient, it, it, we are getting a vector. Gradient of, of, a, of a certain function is a vector. And really, the, for practical purposes, this is more important. We have to calculate derivatives of the function with, with appropriate uh, variables. So, x component of the gradient is derivative of potential energy with respect to x. Y component is derivative of potential energy with respect to y. And Z component is derivative of uh, potential energy with respect to z. Uh, all right, so these are the components of the gradient. Force is opposite of the gradient. Really, in order to, to, uh, to have a proof, we would, I mean, it is based on, I think, calc 3. So I can express differ differential change uh, of potential energy when object moves from one location by a differential displacement. And, uh, <coughs> well, recognize that that the change of potential energy is associated with displacement in x direction, y direction, and z direction. It is really from the more general definition of differential of potential energy. It is associated with displacement in all three directions. Well, change in potential energy is opposite to the conservative work, which we, from that we would calculate that it is the scalar product. So these two expressions must be equal Therefore, I recognize that the coefficients in front of dx, dy, and dz are equal. More important is actually how to use it. Let's, let's, take a, let's take a look at the simple case of gravitational potential energy near the surface. Yes, so, I can write down now that potential energy in this coordinate system with a reference at point A, uh, point O, Potential energy is mg times height above the reference level, which happens to be z. So potential energy is equal to m mass of the object, acceleration due to gravity, times elevation. Let's find out what is opposite to the gradient of this function. And so when I want to find uh, weight, I have to calculate the derivative of this function with respect to x what will be the result? Actually, you see it, it's zero. This function is independent of x. Do you see that? So the, it is derivative of a constant. Derivative of a, of a constant is zero. Now when I calculate y component of the uh, gradient, I have to calculate derivative with respect to y. It's again 
zero. It's constant. Now for z, it is a linear function of z. If I calculate derivative of uh, with respect to z, I'm going to get the coefficient in front of z. So it is mg. I have to put minus over here, which means what is the w? Weight. Yeah, I got an ex expression for all three components of weight. Does it make us happy? Yes, right? Because, well, we found out that from this potential energy, gravitational force is equal, x component is zero, y component is zero, and vertical component is minus mz. This will be all for today. Uh, well, uh, see you tomorrow, not Monday.